Well, welcome to the Lucan's National Historic District and the Greystone Society for our lecture series, uh, April uh, 4th. We are, we're happy to have uh, Nancy Webster here tonight to talk to us about uh, Quaker women and, uh, and their role uh, over time, I guess. So we're very interested to hear about that. Just uh, real quick, is, uh, she's uh, uh, curator historian of the National Friends Historical Association an honorary curator at Swarthmore College, uh, which of course is a great, uh, a great Quaker tradition. So, uh, and you've taught occasionally at Swarthmore, Drexel, and Newman, and regularly at uh, Philadelphia Elder Hostel programs, including topics on Quaker history and culture, and uh, regional history, the Underground Railroad. Uh, so we're happy to have her tonight with her extensive background in uh, museum work, 38 countries, uh, 38 states, and four foreign countries. That's what I thought was uh, was great. So getting around and, and, yeah. and talking about things, which is, is wonderful. So we're very happy to have you tonight. Uh, as well, Magnum Cum Laude from Harvard University and double MBAs, MAs in American History and uh, Museum Curatorialship from uh, College of William and Mary. Uh, so very happy to have you tonight and to uh, and learn about a little bit more about Quaker women. So thank you, Nancy, for coming. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad it's a small informal group because I can't read papers, I have to talk to people. And I really think history is storytelling anyway. So um, I know that sounds like a somewhat impressive resume, but I figure when I'm 90, I'll really know something. And in the meantime, I'm just learning. So uh, the topic today that I want to talk about is one that uh, Jen and I had been talking about over some time, which is, there often seems to be a network, a, almost a spider web of relationships that are not readily apparent, but everybody in Chester County seems to know everybody else, both now and then. And so the question is why and how? And so to some degree, you might call this the wider world of Rebecca Lukens. But I wanted to talk about what was particularly or peculiarly Quaker uh, and how that affected the women in this area, and then some of the ways that they did network. And I hope that it makes sense, and I hope that it's interesting. Um, we're not technically in Women's History Month, but we just left it behind. It was March, so uh, that's what we're talking about. And it does come up often because when you read individual biographies of friends, um, this greater network is not readily apparent and only now that we have Twitter and Facebook are we getting back to some of the same kind of of interface between individuals that actually existed even though you think of Chester County as primarily agricultural and certainly not built up the way that it is now. I haven't been out to Coatesville for a while so I was sorry to see that the suburbs have reached you. Um, I, I live in the suburbs in New Delaware County, so I was, was hoping you still had more open space, but I guess down towards Ursuldon, and that way it's still open. So I wanted to talk about the ways that women were expected to behave in the early to mid 19th century, and then Quaker women in particular, and uh, hopefully uh, leave enough time for questions, because I hope this will stimulate some interest. I didn't want to just give you endless biographies. You want that, you can go to Wikipedia. So um, they networked as women, as Quakers, because they were the rare educated women of their day, they networked that way. They had social causes that united them, and they networked through common interests in industry and work, because those were family businesses. And um, certainly Lukens is a good example of the fact that when you got one person on the title, you got the whole family to work. So I'll start off with what was expected of women uh, in the early to mid 19th century. And they had some very gender specific duties for both men and women in those days, uh, both as wives and as mothers. Uh, and the, I better start with Quaker. How many people are here are Quaker? Anybody besides me? Okay, one other. All right, little, little dialogue. I'm not trying to convert you, okay? But uh, Quakerism is a little bit peculiar in that it's uh, one of the more recent Protestant denominations. It came into being in the middle of the 1640s, and it was an attempt, as Methodism would be later, to return to the early primitive Christian church of the first century. They didn't originally intend to form a separate denomination. They were trying to purify the Episcopal church. 
But because it came into being in the 1640s, this was in the English Civil War. And this is why Quakers have predominantly been pacifist, because they came into being in the middle of a very bitter uh, brother against brother situation. Um, for tonight's talk, the two most important facts are probably that uh, it came into being as a denomination uh, about 10 years after Galileo was forced to recant his scientific discoveries. So unlike older religions, it does not have a conflict between theology and science. And indeed, Quakers believed that you understood God's purpose by experience. In fact, it was very common for friends to get, until recently, to get up and say in meeting, this I know, in other words, this I have observed from personal experience, which is indeed the scientific method of examining things. So Quakers and science fit together really well. Um, it also came into being about 10 years after um, King James of England had the first official English translation of the Bible. Anybody who tried to do it before that got burned at the stake. But as of 1629, we get the King James version of the Bible. I still think the most beautiful prose anyone could have written. Um, and like electronics, it took about 10 years for the price for that to come down. But by the 1640s, many people, or most people, could afford to buy a Bible. And so this is why Quakers did away with ministers, because you no longer needed someone who knew Greek and Latin and Aramaic and who could read when most of the congregation was illiterate and would stand in the pulpit and expound upon Holy Scripture. You were now able to read it in your own language, and therefore it became your individual responsibility, Quakers felt, that you do so. Now that means that you're literate which meant that Quakers went in big for education. And as you all know, especially educating women as well as men. So those are the two things that will really impact on Chester County in particular. What else am I leaving out? Um, well, that'll do it. I'm not, as I say, the theology will leave aside. Uh, but it is a participatory religion. You cannot go and be a hermit and be a Quaker. Because the way Quaker, let me tell you a little bit about the structure. Um, first of all, we, we were trying to be simple and, and simplistic and get away from uh, pagan names for months and days. So very originally, we named things like first day, second day, third day, first month, second month, third month, boring, but you get the idea. And um, uh, you had, a, if you had a leading, if you felt that God was revealing something to you, because friends believe in the scriptures, but they also believe that God is continuing to reveal to us, if we pay attention, what he would like us to do. So the two things are equally important. Um, if I think I've had a wonderful revelation from God, you might think I was completely crazy. If God is going to reveal himself, he's going to reveal himself to more than one of us. So that's why the meeting becomes so important to Quakers. And I cannot overemphasize that, especially in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. End of the 20th, into the 21st, we're getting kind of sloppy in our practices. <laughs> but the meeting is your testing place. If you have a true leading, it will be revealed to more than one of you, more than all of you. This is why Quakers will then write letters from one meeting to another saying, this is what we have decided. Is this how you see it? Or as they said, what canst thou say? So for instance, the famous letter from Germantown monthly meeting 1688, where they decided holding slaves was not appropriate. The reason it's in a letter form is they sent it to every other meeting in existence saying, this is how we see God's intent. But we could be wrong. So what do you think? And in order to test that, um, you get together in larger and larger congregations. Now, when you drive around, you'll see signs that say East Cal monthly meeting. It doesn't mean it meets once a month for worship purposes. It's a freestanding congregation that takes care of its own business. Nobody else can dictate to it. And they meet once a month, like other denominations, for who's going to teach first day, sorry, Sunday school, first day school to Quakers. Um, 
it's time for a new roof. How are we going to pay for it? You know, uh, our road needs repaving, whatever it is that are of concern. And so they can meet monthly for business. It means they are a freestanding independent congregation. Um, traditionally, because it took longer to get around in those days, uh, meetings within about a day's trip of one another would get together four times a year as a bigger group to test leadings. Um, and that's called quarterly meeting. You know, it's not hard to figure friends out. You know. And then, because that could be wrong, uh, we get together in what was and still is basically the four state area. Um, New Jersey, except for the immediate New York suburbs, Pennsylvania, most of Maryland and all of Delaware in Philadelphia yearly meeting and we get together and if indeed we are on the right track it should become apparent to most if not all. Now one of the interesting things you may know about friends is that um, if there is a minority that can say without individual prejudice I really don't feel this is the right way to go. We don't do it. You'd think we'd get nothing done. All I can say is I've been clerk of Swarthmore Monthly Meeting for 18 years, and we have everything from the most conservative to the most liberal, politically, uh, economically diverse, and so on. And uh, I have watched the meeting come together more times than not. We do not believe the majority is always right. That's where we differ from most other Americans. Sometimes uh, we stop and we pray if we don't have unity on a, on a view, and a third way reveals itself. Quaker term for that is way opens. Um, sometimes the minority turns out to have been right. So that's why it took us 100 years to free our slaves in the four state area. We were still 100 years ahead of the rest of the country, and there was no Monday morning quarterbacking. So that clear enough to everybody? So people who belong to this denomination, that's how they're going to conduct their daily lives because that's the experience that they've had. Okay. Now because of the emphasis in education, when William Penn came, he founded free schools for girls as well as boys, for African Americans, whether slave or free, which is really unusual in the colonies, and for Native Americans. And that stayed about that way until we fought the revolution, in which case the schools that existed were usually denominationally related. And it's not until 1836 that Pennsylvania gets a public schools law, and then it takes quite a long time to get implemented. And for a long time, the Pennsylvania Germans in particular resisted this because <coughs> they felt that uh, they wanted to have things um, with a Lutheran emphasis. And Quakers were the same way. Quakers had what they called a guarded education. In other words, they wanted you to learn Quaker values. They wanted you to go to a Quaker school. And a lot of these meeting houses still have a school building um, adjacent to them. I'm a regional planner by profession, and uh, I get to called in to give expert testimony in court often, and one of my favorite court cases recently was a school district in Delaware County that found one of their schools redundant, and they wanted to sell the land, and they got a, you know, it's really crucial crossroads where they get lots of money for a big mall that would go in, and they couldn't find the deed. And so they came to the planning department. I said, well, I, I can answer that right away. I'm almost sure I knew the answer. And sure enough, it had belonged to the Religious Society of Friends, the local meeting. And they had had a school on it till the public school needed a place, at which point they erected the public school on the Quaker property. Um, and it remained uh, in school purposes. And the Quakers would not expect it back unless the school ceased to exist. So to the great surprise of the town fathers, the local meeting didn't feel like just giving them the land. You know, they couldn't understand it. There had been a school here for 300 years. Well, they hadn't paid anything for it for 300 years. But it, that, that's the kind of, of, of situation we have throughout Chester and the older part of Chester County, Delaware County. Um, so the education was going to be with friends' values in, in a... a, a church-related school. And the Catholics had their school, the Lutherans, the Episcopalians. Um, that's how it was. What this involved um, is that girls as well as boys learned what were called the mechanical arts. 
Now, I recently heard a postgraduate paper on this, and she assumed the girls were learning shop. But that's not what the mechanical arts mean. It means the everyday application of science. It is a Quaker value repeated again and again by the leading of, and we call them ministers if they speak publicly and their message is felt to be representative of friends. Uh, it's not a term we use anymore, but historically there were public friends and there were private friends. I think I'm the last licensed public friend, which doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. It just means I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, stopped all that stuff in the 60s, you know. 60s changed a lot of things. The um, idea was that it was worth while spending your life in pursuit of things that would help better humankind. And that was the hallmark, that it had to have a useful purpose. This is why when Benjamin West wants to paint, Springfield meeting has a three-day business meeting thinking, what are we going to do? He doesn't want to paint signs or coaches. He wants to just do art. And they couldn't figure it out. And finally, an elder stood up and said, it is unclear to us why Benjamin has this leading. But we believe it is a God-given uh, talent. And so they paid his way to Florence. And as you may know, he never came back to the United States again. Became the first president of the Royal Art Society in London, official painter of the King George II and George III, etc. But that's the idea. You know, it wasn't useful, so it was dubious to friends. <laughs> so the idea of pursuing science was that it should have some purpose that affected daily life. And so to Quakers, the ideal science and in Rebecca Lukens, I can see it very clearly, I don't know if you all will agree with me, is botany. They felt that by observing what else God had created, the animals, but particularly the plants, you could understand our own life cycle, when we are tender and need nourishment, when we are mature and flourish and give birth, when we start to fail and are returning to the earth. And also, um, the biodiversity will give us a better understanding of our planet. Now, I have to say God has a sense of humor. Anybody who creates the Venus flytrap, you know, and a few other things that you study. But have you noticed how many Chester Countyans went into botany? A lot of them Quaker. William Darlington comes to mind. But Grace Anna Lewis, um, Martha Thompson, um, the Vickers, three generations of the Vickers family, and to me with Rebecca, her great interest in her garden and the plants and so on. Quakers were supposed to, from the very beginning, maintain a garden so that they could teach their children through botany about God's purpose. And this was considered an official requirement. We still have these requirements. We call them queries. You, you're supposed to ask yourself these questions every month and see if you're doing what you're supposed to. But um, in, in Philadelphia area now, there are 300 private arboreta. And 275 of them started out as Quaker study gardens. Uh, John Bartram is the most obvious. But we have Pierce's Park, which is now Longwood. Uh, Chanticleer, which eventually the Rosengartens take over, but where is a Ross place before that. And I could go on and on, but that's not part of tonight's talk. My point is that when she was planting her garden and she loved her willows and, and so on, this is part of her Quaker tradition. And she was undoubtedly instructing her children using her plants because this is how she had been taught and this was part of required Quaker doctrine. That makes sense so far? Okay. Um, when you learned the mechanical arts, therefore, you learned science that was useful. So you learned astronomy and physics and uh, mineralogy and so on. It's not shop, it's, it's the applied sciences, if you will. Um, and for women, they learned math so that they could do home management because a gender role was you were the uh, chief financial officer of the family and you were supposed to be able to keep the books and dicker because uh, at the store for the right price for things and so on. Um, and that was part of your rule. So home management was taught and how to balance books was taught as part of the Quaker female curriculum. 
He's getting to see Rebecca in this, <laughs> um, but many other women as well. So this is their background, and no one else is getting this kind of training except certain nuns that are going to become abbesses. So we, we, you know, we all study math, various degrees of success these days, but in, in their day, it was very unusual. Um, the instruction that happened at the schoolhouse was one thing, but the instruction was also expected to be carried forward by the women and particularly the mothers of the family. And as children aged, in order to kind of let them get out into the wider world, because Quakers have this problem. They are supposed to be live in the world, but not be of the world. Unlike the Amish, we don't withdraw. You notice we don't wear gray and black anymore, but we dress cheap. You know, Kmart's my favorite store. Um, you know, spend your money on mortgages and, and education and stuff that where the money's worthwhile. That's typical Quaker frugality. Um, I could tell you a lot of Quaker finance jokes, but I won't. <laughs> um, and so uh, the idea is that uh, in order to get them out of the f shelter of the family when they're teenagers, you apprentice them, not necessarily with formal apprentice papers, but with uh, sending them to live with relatives. And that way they can kind of test their wings in a still guarded environment, but you know, they, they'll do more with an aunt and uncle than they'll feel when they're under the thumb of their own parents. Have you noticed that with your kids? My sister never could understand why her boys would listen to me. But I didn't have them 365 days a year. It was real easy. And I kept the rules really simple. And the boys always listened to me. So, uh, so when you see that kind of thing going on, and Rebecca, for instance, talks about how she spent long periods of time with her cousins and with her aunt and uncle and so on. This was that apprenticeship, getting them ready to get into a wider, not necessarily Quaker world. Um, one of the chief duties of women, and I'll come back to this, this is my favorite topic, so I put it at the end so I wouldn't talk too much about it, um, is that women were also the doctresses of their families. I, I really enjoy rural Delaware and Chester County because most of the doctors until about 1850 out here um, have to have another profession because there are not enough sick people to keep them going. Um, so for instance, in uh, Thornbury Township, there's a man who runs a tavern. And if you come into the tavern every Thursday, he has medical hours at such and such a time. Um, in uh, Birmingham Township, Chester County, there's a man who is a blacksmith. And if you turned up you know, and waited your turn, he'd prescribe over the anvil while he's making something else and tell you what to do. Um, and so this is how uh, things were treated until we got a certain density of population so that you had a density of people who would be sick and need attention. Uh, because it was a hierarchical society, both the industrial and the agricultural communities, and they exist side by side here in Chester County, this falls to women, anyone who's part of the economic family, which meant in the case of the Lucans, not just blood relatives, but for tenant farmers, workers at the mill, which I understand varied anywhere from 50 to, to uh, several hundred, you were responsible for them. It is until the end of the 19th century that we begin to have doctors hired by businesses. And you can begin to see that on the books of things, starting down around Chester with some of the big, like the Chester rolling mills down there and so on. So these women are also providing medicine. And the fact that as they traveled, they often saw a, a relative or a grandparent or a cousin who was ill or had problems, they got an exposure to this at an early age. And again, I assume you're all familiar with Rebecca's uh, diary, and so you know the times that she's talked about this. So even when she was a young girl, so they learned what to do. And this is going to be invaluable later. These family networks, and have you ever noticed that everybody married everybody else? especially in the iron business, <laughs> everybody's related. Um, and so you have these extended families that are Quaker, that are used to interacting, um, and have taught a lot of this as kind of a hands-on apprenticeship before either gender is old enough to marry. So this is the background that these women grew up with, and it's very atypical of the time. 
Um, enough said. Being Quaker, you had some specific religious duties. Uh, if you get read out of meeting or disowned, you don't get shunned. You can come to meeting for the rest of your life. You just don't have the privilege of being on committees or paying to help support the meeting. Isn't that tough? You know, and friends, I, I think, were very stupid because if you married someone who wasn't a Quaker or depending how strict your local meeting was, you know, you might be disowned. Um, Catholics are much smarter. A non-Catholic marries a Catholic. They consider the non-Catholic Catholic from now on. Which is the bigger denomination? Who's smarter about this? <laughs> so the disownments um, did not necessarily break these other ties. Um, but it meant that they, uh, they were responsible for religious instruction, not of their own families, but also teaching what we call first day school, you teach, call Sunday school. And a number of women uh, poetesses, particularly in this uh, county, um, Susan Lukens for one, uh, uh, Rebecca Darlington, uh, Abby Kimber, Susan Kimber, um, Louisa Oberholzer, and so on, wrote not just poetry, but also wrote little booklets for religious teachings. Um, and there's quite a long bibliography of that in the, uh, for the Encope history of Chester County, and you can take a look at some of that too. Um, what else did I want to say? If you notice, not only did they go to Quaker boarding schools, and Rebecca went to Wilmington, but West Town comes online. I have a whole list of them, so I can read them to you if you want. Um, uh, Westchester comes online soon thereafter. Um, West Town, 1779, which is a lot of the smaller ones, got folded into West Town. Uh, when Quakers split because we had a religious in-house difference, which I won't go into. It's too arcane to be interesting. Um, but it was 1826-27. Um, all the more liberal Hicksite Quakers go to George School in Bucks County, and all the more conservative ones go to West Town. Um, but it also was a question of geographic proximity. So you get some Chester County families still going to West Town, even if they're slightly different flavored Quaker. Um, and uh, because they were among the few educated women of their day, they in turn, most of them taught school at some point in their lives. And you look at virtually any woman of note in 19th century Chester County, they've taught school. Grace Anna Lewis, who is more known for her botany and her ornithography, as well as temperance, women's rights, and Underground Railroad, um, taught school in five different Quaker institutions. Um, and then returned to that in her 70s when she was broke. And speaking of which, you know, people always wondered why the Lewises went broke. Well, if you read William Still, he says that they're taking care of over 100 fugitives a, a week at the Lewis homestead. And this is when you have to provide clothing and shoes, and going into a different ecosystem if you've come up from the Deep South. They were the medical stop for this whole area. More about that later. Um, they used the income of their farm and their mines to pay for the Underground Railroad. No wonder they were broke. And they said, well, you know, they didn't have fancy furniture. No, they were Quakers. They spent it on good works. More about that later, too. So that you'll notice that most of these women did teach. But the real key training place for them, besides the schoolhouse, was the women's meeting. It was thought up until the 1880s in Quakers uh, and other denominations that uh, People worshipped better with the men all on one side and the women all on the other. No hanky-panky would go on then. This is, the remains of this is when we have groom's side and bride's side at the, at the weddings. That's about the only place it survives. But all of us used to sit segregated. Um, and they found that when discussing practical issues and social issues, both genders felt freer expressing themselves among similar genders. Now, I don't know whether that's henpecked men or, or put upon women. You can take your pick. I suspect a little of both. But um, they would meet separately once a month for business purposes. And some things were, again, on gender roles. For instance, the physical upkeep of the meeting house tends to be something that men's meeting deals more with. 
women's meeting deals with social issues more. Care of the poor. Someone is old and has no one to take care of them. We have to find someone who will give them space in their house and the meeting will subsidize the food. If you've ever read Quaker Minutes, um, you'll see these cases come up. And uh, they won't name names usually, but there's some really interesting things, including sometimes scandalous stuff like who got drunk on market day and who's spending too long in the woods with somebody else's daughter and, you know, this kind of, you really want to get the scoop, read the Quaker Business Minutes. It's, it's incredibly intrusive to life, as we would think today, but the idea was that uh, you're your brother's keeper. So, uh, so dealing with the women's meeting, they're not only, again, keeping financial track of sometimes quite large expenditures of money for schooling, uh, for buying books, for providing uh, shelter and care for the sick, for the poor, um, raising food for the homeless. I mean, food banks are nothing new. The first food bank in this area starts in 1772. Um, and during the time when Rebecca Lukens is active, she went through what was one of the worst financial periods in American history, the Great Panic of 1837, which makes our recent depression look like nothing. Um, and so this was something that th there was a lot of demand for, and they needed to carefully husband their resources and be able to justify how they had expended it. And then they would report as a whole to the men and women assembled together. Does this all make sense so far? Um, some of the old meeting houses, you'll even see they have dividing panels that can be lowered so the women can meet separately and relatively soundproofed from the men and then they all come together. But the, what this did is give you a financial training, a hands-on money handling training that nobody else was getting. So they got it as trained in school, but they also got it as part of Quaker meeting. Um, the medicine and the poor, care of the poor, is always traditionally women's meeting ever since the first generation of Quakers spent most of their time in jail for uh, their beliefs, and it, has, it continues to this day being one of the things. So they also learned how to deal with committee structure. So when you come to deal with businesses and boards and trade unions and things, it's just like committee structure. And we forget how indoctrinated we all are with this. But back in the early to mid 19th century, women just didn't get out of the home. And perhaps the most important thing in some ways is that in an age when most people rarely had traveled more than 15 or 20 miles from their own homes, these people traveled, including overseas. Quakers are a do-it-yourself religion. If you don't make contact with one another, then nobody's going to do it for you. There's no paid minister to do this. So on the committees, of whether it was for social causes or for internal Quaker management, um, there was a lot of traveling, if only to quarterly or yearly meeting. Yearly meeting was held alternate years in Burlington, New Jersey, and in Philadelphia. Last week of March, they used to, it always rains, it still does. <laughs> uh, it's right before most of the planting season, so that's why. And the Philadelphians always said, here come the Quakers, it's going to rain all week. But um, the, uh, the situation is that you had duties that you had to carry out. And then depending on how you felt God was leading you, and the Quaker term for that is a concern. Um, my personal concern that I feel I've had has been to work with Native Americans. And I have done that since I was about 16. Um, I'm one of the six official treaty keepers because when William Penn made his treaty with eight different Indian nations that he did, he actually made two treaties, one on behalf of the crown, which is long broken, and the other on behalf of the Religious Society of Friends. And we have never broken our word on anything. And so it's very difficult being one of the six treaty keepers. You think, 350 years, I don't want to be the one that screws up. So, um, but it's, you know, you test that. And if you, it is a true leading, others will support you with time or money or just encouragement. Lots of times babysitting your kids so you can go somewhere. 
And they traveled, and they traveled extensively. They traveled from here up to Canada, down into Mexico, eventually out to the far west, and so on. So that at a time before railroads, and even once the railroads are being built, um, Quaker men and women are seeing the world in a way that their contemporaries are not. Does this make sense to you all? I mean, I'm not trying to say we're better. I'm just saying it's different. Um, this meant also, in the mores of the time, women were still fair flowers of femininity. And you needed to protect them. And usually you had a male escort. Lots of times there are two women traveling in the ministry, which is what we call Quaker business. Um, and they will have a male escort to take care of them. And you did not stay in public places because these were often rowdy taverns. Uh, people would knock your door down by mistake in the middle of the night or whatever. You stayed with families that you knew. So here is this extensive family and Quaker friendly network at its best. And vice versa, you opened your house to the people who traveled. So in the later part of the 19th century, you wonder why some of our little poetesses here in Chester County are on a first name basis with Walt Whitman and, and John Greenleaf Whittier and, and so on. It's because they had housed them here as those people went around in the Lyceum network and then eventually the Chautauqua network. They had stayed in their homes. Now, I don't know if anyone here has DuPont connections, but my family is all Sun Oil. And Sun Oil and DuPont are still family businesses or were till the recent past. And when I was growing up, anyone who came to see my father, who was head of research and development for Sun Oil, stayed in our house. There were plenty of darn good hotels, but they stayed in our house because that's what you did. And if you've traveled in Europe or the Far East, this is still the way things are done. Um, so the women not only had to be official hostesses and DuPont, you know, often, and same as, same as the Pew family for Sun Oil, they would interview both the man and the woman. If they were going to hire the man, they wanted to make sure the woman was going to be up to snuff. Any of you ever encountered that? But it, it was the way business was done. Um, and so um, this is how they got to know people that you might think otherwise were out of their geographic region that they wouldn't know. Um, the last Quaker thing I wanted to mention that really had an influence on women was it is a Quaker sin to have too much money. It's a Quaker sin to be in debt. And uh, most of us don't have credit cards. Um, it's, that's a form of debt, and it's not always approved. But um, if you have too much money, the implication is you may have taken advantage of someone else. So other than taking care of your family adequately, um, if you start to have a lot of money, you're expected to do something philanthropic with it. Um, and this is why there are so many small um, funds, if you ever do foundation grant applications. You know, in Pennsylvania, we have lots of small family foundations. It goes back to this. But also, there was a lot of anonymous donations through the meetings, which is how they paid for the poor and medical and food care for those who, who could not do it themselves. But you also find records of when a new church is starting up, members of the other churches will give money to that. So you'll see Presbyterians contributing to friends meetings and friends contributing to Episcopal meetings. It goes back to William Penn's idea that what you want is a moral citizenry. It's not so much which religion, it's just if you have religion, you will treat people morally. And that's the kind of person you want to live next door to. And they also would provide money, often anonymously, to a tradesperson who perhaps didn't have the money to start up but was desirable to have in the community. Uh, you find blacksmiths getting funded this way. You find wheelwrights getting funded this way, carpenters. I noticed that uh, in the, the Lucan's account books, there's some anonymous donations that I suspect very much are this kind of thing, and fairly large amounts of money, too. So this is a, this is a Quaker pattern that you know, it's how you get rid of your extra money and do good with it. Again, is it being useful to mankind, to humankind? OK. Um, the ladies that Rebecca would have known and does indeed write to, uh, and I 
I want to make sure I don't talk too long to her. Um, often were social cause related people. And I don't know, I know the question often comes up, was she part of the Underground Railroad? We will never know. It was an illegal activity, folks. You don't write down that you're doing it. <laughs> um, when uh, Robert Smedley and others come through and document it afterwards, they missed a lot of people that we know were active. And if you just look at whom she's writing to and whom she's dealing with, they are all very active abolitionists. So I suspect she was helping fund the cause even if she wasn't directly participating herself. But um, she has, she's one of the people who, in the way of the business that I just mentioned in philanthropy, um, when Esther Lewis uh, is widowed uh, in, what is that, East Pikeland, West Pikeland? Actually, Vincent. Vincent, okay, thank West you. Vincent. Yes, I always get mixed up on the boundary there. Um, anyway, Chester Springs, <laughs> uh, and has four daughters under the age of six, and her husband dies young of typhus, probably from helping uh, escaping, escaping uh, in, enslaved persons. Um, he dies 1824. Uh, they find uh, iron and then graphite on the property, and no one will give Esther the time of day because she's a woman. So she turns to another woman. She turned to Rebecca Lukens for what do I do about this? You know, how do I get it evaluated so I know whether it's worth mining? And they tried, first of all, going to the Phoenix Iron Works. She didn't get such a great answer there. That was the immediate locale that she was in. Um, finally, she goes down to Baltimore with a connection that she did not know, but Rebecca Lukens did. And I am sure it was a direct reference, you know, referral from Rebecca and indeed gets her iron and her graphite certified, and then they start to mine it right there on the property. You can still see it there at Sunnyside. Um, and a great family partnership is formed there. Um, Esther's daughter that was most active was Grace Anna, um, just as Rebecca Lukens is considered the first woman entrepreneur of any large note in American history. Grace Anna is one of the first two women scientists in the United States. The other being a Quaker from Nantucket, Mariah Mitchell, who goes on to teach astronomy at S I always get the name Smith, not Vassar Smith. Um, and uh, Grace Anna was an ornithologist uh, and a botanist. And one of the things these women had learned and was considered the proper thing for women to learn, whether Quaker or not, was uh, painting and illustration. If you weren't Quaker, you tended to paint China and do stuff like that. If you were Quaker, you drew the natural world around you. And that's how Grace Anna got started. She drew what was on their farm. Her drawings got seen by the curator down at the um, Academy of Natural Sciences, John Casson, and he hires her. And until 1912, when she died, she starts illustrating the huge collections of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And uh, she says the hardest one was the gorilla because he moved around. And he's the, f the first animal in the Philadelphia Zoo started 1859, but anyway. So um, you have Rebecca teaching her daughters painting, but they go on to do things uh, like do family portraits, but do sign painting. Um, do Ill botanical illustrations. Um, one of them does the illustrations for William Darlington's book on the flora of Chester County. Um, and so this kind of thing that was happening. They go into teaching. The nearest academy where any of the Lucan's girls studied or taught was in Kimberton, run by Emmer Kimber and his daughters, um, Abby being the most distinguished, and uh, she was uh, she was born 1804, so she's a little bit older than the Lukens' children, but uh, close enough. Um, and <clears throat> remember, too, we have the other botanical uh, tradition going on, starting with Humphrey Marshall, but going on down through this area, including the Pyle family, um, which is still known for their star roses, and so on. I mean, I could go on and on, but you, you know this Chester County tradition as well as I. Um, one of the other things that the Lukens household did that people of a certain financial stature were expected to do was to lend books. You had a teaching garden. If people were too poor to have one themselves, you were supposed to open it so they could bring their children in. But if you had books, you were supposed to lend them. So if you look at the roots of most of the public libraries 
in northern Chester County, they go back to the iron owners' estates where they lent them from their mansions to the local populace. And uh, if you look at the Doylestown and the Coatesville Public Library, guess who the first books came from? So it's again in that educational tradition. Um, the social causes that were taken up by friends meetings uh, and Quakers were perhaps annoyingly persistent on these, they were a little bit ahead of their time, was first of all temperance, which had a direct relationship to your working environment. You didn't want your workers drunk, and certainly if you were pouring iron, you are not want them drunk. Um, Ursuldon, which of course is where the Lucans have their closest connection, uh, and Longwood progressive meeting, which starts in the 1850s, were the two biggest abolitionist meetings in the area, and they hosted a lot of the nationally known abolitionist speakers, which meant that their members took them in. Um, William Lloyd Garrison evidently stayed with the Lucans at one point, and he was pretty inflammatory, so you didn't necessarily agree with them, but you offered, uh, you hosted the people that came. And um, any of you been in People's Hall next to Fallow Field meeting? Okay. Um, it was built originally to have temperance meetings, but it became kind of the, the lyceum for the area, the place where you had public meetings, and they had a lot of abolition meetings. And I always love, they have a motto painted across the top, let me see, let truth and error grapple. And so they had lively discussions. In fact, so lively that at one point fistfights poured out of it and they had to break it up with the, with the local sheriff. But there, there was a hotbed of abolitionism and that's where they're going to meeting. So I really think she has ties. Her friends are all involved. The Kimbers ran an underground railroad station right out of their school and it only ended when Emmer died in 1850. His wife was a Jackson. They ran one of the biggest underground stops in eastern <coughs> Delaware County in what is now Sharon Hill um, as a school and so on and so forth, but, uh, uh, and, and of course the Lewises. Um, but the other, the other aspect of this too was there was concern for Native Americans. And you all know the legend of Indian Hannah in Chester County. The local Lenape stayed recognizably in this area longer than most of Eastern Pennsylvania and to some degree that uh, highlighted the concern of Native Americans throughout the 19th century to friends. And locally, the Halliday family, the Elkington family, the Stevens family, the Darlington family, all sent representations um, with friends helping with money for care and medical care, for education, to teach farming techniques and so forth for almost a hundred years from this part of the country. So chances were that she was exposed to these because she visited regularly socially with these families. Um, the Lyceums come through, all kinds of speakers. At Longwood you have the really radical ones, you know, you get Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and all those fun people. Um, but you also have uh, the emphasis on an, uh, this, is, this is something this generation understands. I don't Twitter. I rarely do Facebook. I'm archaic in my own time. The 19th century way that people communicated was by letter. The beauty of your handwriting, the precision with which you could express yourself, your vocabulary, all of this helped with your communication or did not help, as the case may be. So part of your education was to learn how to write these letters, whether they were personal letters to family members, friend to friend, small f, or you were writing on behalf of your meeting. This was a technique that was very important, and most of the letter writers uh, of anything but business tend to be women. And they not only wrote letters, they wrote poetry. You notice how many minor poets there are, poetesses there are in Chester County? Um, Rebecca Lukens has even left some of her poetry. She talks about how she loves Sir Walter Scott. And you know, Quakers kind of frowned on novels because novels are made up, they're not true life. Quakers were against painting but for photography because photography didn't lie. There was no airbrushing in those days. Um, so so the, the idea of being literate and putting, uh, you know, being able to express yourself 
um, was important. And when these literary figures came through on the, the traveling lecture circuit, they showed their poetry to them. They talked to them. This is why you would write a letter to John Greenleaf Whittier when he goes back to New England, because he's read your poetry. He knows who you are. He stayed a week in your house. And so they have this national, and in some cases international, uh, literary connection that because they were educated women, other women did not have the advantage of. And you see it again and again, not only in the Lucan's family archives, but in the families of the others in this area. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the work-related emphasis that women had to handle. Ever wonder why Rebecca could take over the, the business? I mean, nothing against Charles. It, he wasn't his formal training. But aside from being daddy's little girl and evidently playing all over the slitting mill when she was a little girl, um, the idea that, that you had a scientific background, you had some understanding of metalwork and so forth, if you were female, um, not just if you were male. There's an apocryphal story that they tell about Rebecca that you've probably heard, that um, someone gave her a, a cast iron kettle for the, for the kitchen, and uh, when she was cooking in it, it blew up. And this was not uncommon. One of the things that we don't think about is we had a, I do a whole week's teaching at, at Drexel on early science in Philadelphia. We have a lot of scientific breakthroughs in this area, but what we don't have is the daily technology to implement the scientific ideas. We've been behind on how you actually carry this stuff out in a practical workplace. And one of the big problems that uh, George Washington had actually asked um, Benjamin, no, sorry, David Rittenhouse to solve during the revolution was exploding cannon. You know, we began to make cannon for ourselves, and you know all the iron deposits around here and the literally dozens of forges and small iron works that are in this area, or were in Rebecca's time. Um, but they could not, because they had not been allowed to under the mercantile system of the British Empire, um, hadn't done a lot of refining. So small impurities, little pieces of sand, little air bubbles would be in the cannon that were cast for the revolution. And one out of every four of our artillerists died of their cannon exploding. You didn't have to worry about what the British was going to do. And once the revolution is over, we still have not solved that problem. Rittenhouse solved the other problem Washington asked him to do, which was about gunpowder. But this, this one he didn't solve. And actually, it's not solved until 1826 by Rebecca Lukens. It's not just boilerplate that we should remember her for, but she studied the system of refining and made adjustments in it so that for the first time we could make iron boilers, and then eventually steel, but iron boilers that could take the pressure. We knew about steamboats. The first steamboat is not Robert Fulton's Claremont. It's here, it's, um, oh, come on, Nancy. Fitch, John Fitch, who comes and takes up with a, Quaker from uh, uh, the, the Virgin Islands, who's a doctor who gets really fed up after the yellow fever epidemic, um, William Thornton. And they build a ship called the Perseverance, and it had a rack with paddles on each side, and it sort of swam the Australian crawl upriver in, on the Delaware, eight, eight miles an hour upriver, which given the Delaware current's pretty good. Um, and they took Congress out to show them this wonderful new technology, first congressional junket that I can find, 1787. But when they built a bigger boiler so the boat could go faster, the pressure on the iron with its impurities made the boilers blow up. And this happens with the, with the early locomotives. So it is until this new refining technique that Rebecca introduces after they've learned how to make the boiler plate, but she learns how to refine out the impurities, that suddenly we start to have steamboats on the Ohio and the Mississippi with the big boilers. We start to have the big railroads. Um, she is an example of what the other women in connected with family businesses and Vickers learns how to refine the clay better so they can make better clay pots. You know, the women are looking at the process. And if you understand that women did most of the cooking, it's process. You know, men think technique, women think process. And if you can make generalizations like that. Uh, but it's this kind of thing that um, really is 
what the training that they had in the sciences made them able to do. And Rebecca Lukens is a exam fine example of this. Women were supposed to be concerned with the care of the workers and the workers' families. And I think to her eternal credit, during the middle of this really bad panic in the 1830s, she doesn't lay anybody off. They slow down, but she doesn't lay anybody off. She takes care of them in a way that her male business contemporaries are not. They're laying people off right and left. Um, she provides the um, medical care, um, and it seems clear that some of her early training um, is, is, has been in this, but she also then talks to Esther Lewis about what, uh, what kinds of things has she found that she needed for the people who worked in her iron manufactory. And everybody's related. Esther Lewis was a fussel. Her brother, Bartholomew Fussell of Kennett Square, was one of the most prominent doctors of the time. And in 1850, five Quaker doctors, four of whom are based in Chester County, one of whom is from Philadelphia, say, you know, we have sisters and mothers who are better doctors than we are, even though they have had no formal training. And it's about time that women, Quaker women being equal, uh, should get medical training, and they found the Female Medical College of Philadelphia, which existed as a very fine institution until <clears throat> the gentleman from Allegheny bought everything up and drove it into the ground, and we won't talk about that, but that recent scandal. Um, so you have Anne Preston, for instance, of West Grove and London Grove, who's one of the first doctors officially certified, and she becomes the first dean of that medical school. She creates an all-woman hospital in 1861, just after Rebecca's death, but trains people so that they're ready when the Civil War comes. Um, Chester County sent over 80 Quaker women as nurses to the front in the Civil War that had formal medical training and they got it at the female college. The female college also taught thousands of people in this area to take care of the sick and wounded from that war because once you could, once you were out of danger, they couldn't do anything more for you, one or the other. Uh, they needed your bed and you were sent home even if you weren't ambulatory. So a lot of people had people to care for at home literally for years. And so that training came. And so they are also training people. And there is a group that is there at the women's college that is paid for by an anonymous group called the Wives of the Iron Forges so that they learn about particularly bad burns, crushing incidents, the kinds of things that happen in iron mills. Who are they training but wives and people who are going to have to do this for families on the job? Don't you find that fascinating? Um, what else do I say? There are all kinds of inventors here. You know, the Sharplesses are making their cream separator and their road grader and all kinds of things. The cream separator came from Mrs. Sharpless. Um, but what I think is most interesting, and one of the things you may not know fully, is starting in 1824, um, in a true kind of Quaker idea, because we do everything by committee. You know, it takes us longer, but we do everything by committee. Um, there was a group of 30 business persons from this area who decided that while you might make a discovery and have a technological advantage in your mill or business for six months or a year, you would benefit more by sharing it with others because they will share with you. And that's the basis of the Franklin Institute. The first female member is Rebecca Lukens. Um, she works on the first US government contract um, on this, which is why we know what she did for the exploding boilers. But more importantly even than that, the Franklin Institute is where you would meet the industrial leaders of not just Chester County, but this whole area. We're running until the Civil War mostly on water power. Steam power only comes in at the time of the Civil War. And then you can move your business to where the transportation connections are better, and I will end very shortly. Um, and you know about the watershed and all that. I don't have to talk about that. But um, the first study the Franklin Institute does is which is the most effective mechanical system, an overshot wheel, a breast wheel, or an undershot wheel. In 2,000 years, no one had ever studied it. And they come up with the overshot wheel 
is the most efficient. They, they built and tested every single U.S. patent filed until 1990 at their own expense. So you could put your life savings into building widgets and you would know that widgets at least could be made. Maybe no one would buy them, but they would function. This, think of it, if they hadn't done this, you know, where would the United States be worldwide in technology? What has been our edge has come from the Franklin Institute. And until the 1850s, Rebecca died 1854, right? Yeah. Um, about that time, the large woolen mills in Lowell, Massachusetts are coming online. And for the first time, there is a business concentration other than Philadelphia and the immediate west of Philadelphia. Up until the Lowell Mills, over 80% of the industry of the United States is within 25 miles of Philadelphia. So if you want to know why this connections and these webs and this training was important, there it is. We don't get taught that. I don't know why we don't get taught that, but we don't. And so this connection and the women talking to each other, the men talking to each other, women and men together talking, as in the Franklin Institute, is very, very important. And the technological solutions they are finding for the early science that the uh, people like the APS, sorry, American Philosophical Society and so on are discovering the science, but how you apply it. And that's what America has always been good at. And hopefully we will continue to lead the world in this. The Japanese can make it smaller, the Indians can make it quicker, hopefully we still can do it. But that wider intellectual world is right on the doorstep of these women. And they are connected to it in a sisterhood uh, and a connection that is both Quaker, that is education, that is part of hosting business and um, cultural visitors to your community. Um, and I, I have names and names and names that I haven't named here, but I've talked enough. But I hope that makes some sense to you on why um, it's not that Quakers are better, they just had this kind of a system that fits so well with what was going on in the early to mid uh, pre-Civil War uh, Chester County. So thank you, and, and I'd love to have a discussion if you all haven't gone to sleep by now. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Okay, um, you make black powder out of three basic ingredients that are pretty easy to get. You know, charcoal, um, potassium nitrate, which comes from night soil among other things, and um, what, charcoal, potassium nitrate, sulfur. The English powder, everybody had these smooth bore muskets pretty much. I mean, riflemen weren't that many, so we'll just talk about the smooth bores. Um, they had a basic range of 80 to 100 yards with, with some accuracy. The British, when they used their gunpowder, the bullet would actually go 80 yards. Oh. The Americans, when they fired with their gunpowder, it went 30. Did you ever wonder why we lost so many battles in the Revolution? I mean, the Battle of, of Montreal is one side fires once, the other side fires once, that's the end of the battle, because they can be upon you with their bayonet if you're, you know, have to take 14 steps to reload. So our, our gunpowder absorbed water and got mushy. So half the time it didn't go off. It just had a, what they call flash in the pan. The priming powder went off, but it didn't go through the touch hole into the barrel. Um, and you know, it, it, you know, Washington was losing like crazy. And he said, we have to solve this. So Rittenhouse, within six months, comes up with a new formula and way of preparing gunpowder. And then our gunpowder is as good, if not better, than the British. But you know, the early part of the war, we really had a bad time. Um, um, again, it's in the process. It's not so much the ingredients. It's how you cared for them, how you stored them. He had the charcoal ground up from the beginning so that it didn't keep moisture. If you had just the charred sticks, you know, there could be moisture inside. Um, it's, again, this process. It's this technology versus science. And, and I wish I could talk more about that, because to me, that's what's fascinating. That's what all our little inventors out here are doing. They are doing this stuff. It's like the Darlingtons, and this area was the butter belt. Why do we do so well with butter? Because all those good Quaker housewives are being really careful, sterilizing. Any, anybody who has German or Quaker ancestry, everything's boiled and scrubbed to death, right? You know, that's, it's just part of 
those cultures. And so in butter making, you're keeping the um, bacteria down. Uh, it's longer before the butter begins to taste bad and so on. And so, you know, Philadelphia area butter was in great demand in Boston and shipped around the horn to California during the gold rush and everything else. And it's not that they knew how to make butter better. It's that they did the process with careful attention to every detail. And that's part of, to Quakers, the process determines the outcome. I don't know how else to explain this, except it's built into the culture from the very beginning. If the process is not right ordered, the outcome cannot be. And uh, I'll give you an example from a different culture. Uh, I was out, and I have to go back soon, to do water rights legislation in, in New Mexico and Arizona on behalf of some of the Pueblo cultures where the water is not coming all the way down the Colorado anymore or the Santa Fe River and they're having to give up their animals, they're having to bring in truckloads of water, it's, it's really bad. And after we finished uh, one treaty, which now is gonna be before the Supreme Court, uh, we got it, I couldn't believe it, we got it through the New Mexico and Arizona state courts, I really didn't think we would. Um, the traditional Indian leaders of the Pueblo said, now we must follow the river to its source. And I thought, oh, they're gonna look for illegal dumping, you know, illegal use of water, you know, as a regional planner, that made a lot of sense, super fun sites, you know. And as we did it, that's not what they were doing. They were praying for guidance and we went to the headwaters to say the prayer so that the water would run free and everything would be right ordered. And as a Quaker, that made sense to me because if it's not rightly done, the outcome cannot be right. And that's just part of the Quaker tradition. I'm not saying it's better than anybody else. It's just part of the tradition that is so inculcated in you from very early childhood that you don't even think about it. Um, and that's what these people out here, why they were so successful in their various manufacturings because they were careful about every step of the process and how they did. They tried to treat the workers fairly so that they would work as hard as possible. They tried to provide education so people wouldn't do dumb things because they hadn't been taught better. And uh, it shows in Chester County's prosperity. So, I'm sorry, I've talked you guys to death. I apologize, <laughs> yes. I'm gonna completely change the subject Good. And, and offer a footnote to Nancy's lecture. Um, during the part where you were mentioning some of the um, Quaker women who were poets, uh, she mentioned Susan Lukens, and I'm sure some people wonder, Susan Lukens. Susan Lukens was Solomon's wife, and when Solomon, after working with Rebecca for 15 years, finally leaves um, the Brandywine Ironworks, he marries Susan, and the two of them go off into western, southwestern New York to do basically Sen Seneca missionary work. work with the Native Americans. Seneca State. work, yeah. Oh, just, uh, just because the name came up, and she doesn't, she doesn't There's so show many up connections. Often, well, there's so many but, connections. I thought it was better to give you the overall picture yes, than just stand just up here and recite biographies. Her, and she was. And she was a published poet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was considered, um, you know, Quakers don't do music, but they sure as heck write. Right. And it wasn't just, you know, in spouse temperance in the local newspaper. It was, was this kind of thing. It was a sign of perspective on your life, that you are taught from the very beginning that there is something always greater than you. Um, and you need to do things in your life to keep that perspective, whether it's immerse yourself in nature or good works or all of the above or whatever, and that's what she was doing. Thank you, I didn't know that about her. Oh. <laughs> so, yes. If I remember correctly, the book is called Gleanings in 75. Oh, yes, yes it is, yeah. I think, yeah. It's Where's Paul Rodebaugh when I need him? Paul had every Chester know. County title memorized. I could always ask Paul if I, I didn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you have a lot of them, and uh, well, three of the Vickers girls write poetry that's published in um, mm -hmm. uh, Harper's Weekly and things like that. So they're not just published amongst Quaker publications, but at a time when Godey's Ladies book and Peterson's and others are starting up magazines for women, 
this is you know, this is something the Quakers do that's socially acceptable, where perhaps votes for women wasn't. But um, anyway, radical group, but did fit in. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm Skip Houston. Huh. Scott's now. Uh, I'm interested in really, really more of what you said about Rebecca Lukens. Have you, uh, you, you say you're a writer. Is there a chance of maybe getting more and more information of the things that you did technically? I would like writing? to know. I have spent some time in the Franklin Institute Library. Um, this is what I mean when I say when I'm 90 I'll know something. Um, and I came across some things that she's credited with. Wow. Um, I have not spent a lot of time in your archives. But the, one of the problems with most of these people is their letters scattered here, there, and everywhere. And up until the PC age, NUCMUC, which is the National Library's Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections, um, only listed things that were groups of 50 or more papers. So you might have three pivotal letters from George Washington, but nobody's going to know you have them. Now, with the internet, as you may have noticed, daily libraries and, and historical societies are listing more and more what's in their repositories and a whole new generation of scholarship is going to change a lot of what we think and know. So I think that's how you're going to find it out. And I think there's more at the Franklin Institute. Unfortunately, oh, now I'm showing my prejudice. Okay, this is my own opinion. You don't need to agree. Um, they changed in 1990. So many companies were having their own R&D departments that they no longer needed to do what they had been. And that's when they became a family-friendly science museum. And they do not have the scholars coming and using the library. They had a president. He was only president for three years, but he sold off all their collections. And they went hither and yon. Um, they didn't stay together. So a lot of people are trying to figure out where stuff went. Um, but sooner or later, it will start to surface on the internet. And uh, I think that this is going to be a very fruitful area for if you know anyone who's interested in this young scholar looking for a PhD thesis, I would highly recommend this. Um, I'm 66. I'm not sure how much more I'm going to do. But um, the, uh, the interest, in, and this is what these men were, and women were doing, uh, another woman joins the Franklin Institute three years after Rebecca, but she for a while is the only one. Um, what they're doing is, is saying, you know, I have, well, Thomas Leeper is one. He goes, he makes improvements on the snuff mills. Well, this area, as you know, down through Delaware was big tobacco country till the recent past. And everybody made snuff the same way, but when, when Thomas Leeper shows how he made better snuff, then they all start doing it. So this is why the sharing was to everybody's advantage, very much a Quaker committee idea. Um, and the, their own minutes show in detail some, but not all, of the technological research. Well, I just did a follow-up, because I know when I asked somebody else to talk. One of the things that was impressed upon me, my grandfather, who was Quaker, had quite a Quaker influence. I don't know how that came to answer. One thing, you stayed living next to the mill. Well, you didn't get so uppity, you had to move to the main line. He married, he married a vegetarian in Savannah. And he was, and he referred to the fact that he was set aside. He was no longer in line to be, uh, his, his brother, Frank, yeah. then was a person who uh, came in the line. My grandfather became a vice president, but he should have been, because of his technology, he should have been the, the successor. Yep. Now, what I want to get to, though, is he always impressed upon me that the, that, the, that the process is the answer. He said that the, yeah. the proof is in the process. Right, and very quicker. Was, was a specialty steel company, especially because we got into refinement of different steel processes. And we were able to uh, compete with the larger companies who did large batch volume. We did specialty by refined steel. Yeah. Even today, we're the only nuclear steel uh, uh, qualified company. Yes, and, and you see this goes back to the very beginning. It really is part of this tradition. So I didn't mean to be gender biased here, although that's what I was asked to speak on. But I'm, I'm glad you, you can give that from your own experience. Uh, because it, it does, you know, I'm telling you this is true now. You, you, know, you can make up your own minds whether it is or not. But, but, uh, I, but I, I appreciate this chance to talk to you about a kind of esoteric topic, but one that influences our economic and our cultural history in ways that th these networks are not immediately apparent. And one thing about the, the Quaker uh, rightly or wrongly, a lot of Quakers founded banks around here. 
And because um, originally um, the meeting would make good any debt that an individual Quaker incurred. You always had to have a letter of transfer. Did you ever wonder why? It's if you're moving to the Ohio country, if you go into debt, your meeting back here in West Bradford or, or Euclid or wherever you're from will pay that debt. Um, it got to be where Quakers didn't have to provide collateral to some banks that were run by Quakers because your family had a history of always paying. This is why debt is the ultimate Quaker sin. And so they may have felt that now he was no longer fully Quaker. Maybe the finances would be a little shaky. I don't know, but there was that, I mean, I'm sure they weren't, but, uh, but there was that bias because it was so much a cultural, uh, religious emphasis. Okay, well, thank you. You've been very patient, and I apologize for going over time. Is it clearly recorded in the Franklin Institute's records that Rebecca was the first woman? Yes. I never heard that. It's I had not either. Didn't know. And, yeah. and well, how do you? How I, do you? I'm quoting their their recently retired librarian of 40 years, I, Irene um, Coffey. Uh, she showed me the record. I didn't look at everybody else's records. I yeah. took her word for it because she was the head librarian and had been there forever. Mm -hmm. But um, there, you were allowed to bring your family. Excuse me, I need to sit down. I have a bad leg. Um, you were allowed to bring family members to the meetings. They just were not allowed to discuss or vote. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how many daughters or wives may have sat in on it. When you're running these smaller mills, it's a whole family business. Everybody knows what's going on. Lots of times it's the wife's dowry that's paying for the improvements in the mill. Um, so we, we don't know how much female participation there was. Well, when the Franklin Institute was established, uh, what was the initial organization? Just as a scientific? It was, it was a scientific, yes. but a hands-on scientific group as opposed to a the, it, it, as opposed to pure science, uh, which was more APS. Um, so Rebecca and, would have been there. And they pay, you paid thirty dollars a year to be a member, right. and and it was uh, to help with the, the, just all this great growth of our first uh, our first industrial right. period of growth in the twenties and thirties. Um, and so you would have benefited. I mean, sometimes what they were talking about wouldn't pertain to your particular business. So. You would just listen. But she would have been there as a guest or someone? She might have come before that. She, uh, there's no record of Charles being a member. Okay. And it started 1824. Well, he died. Yes, he died. He died the next year, so I'm saying it's not surprising. And um, her father wouldn't have joined because it didn't exist in his time. Mm -hmm. So uh, she, you, you don't know. But um, I know that Thomas Leeper regularly took his wife and daughter. She's recorded as a member. Or She's recorded as a member. Yeah, so later so they did allow. Well, you got to remember, it. you know, Philadelphia was still a Quaker city culturally yeah. and socially. Sure. Yeah. The Philadelphia Horticultural Society, for 70 years, it started in 1827. For 70 years, it was the only horticultural society in the United States that allowed women as members. Yeah. Um, if, in Quakerism, there is no sex; everyone's equal, right. Right. theoretically right. at least, and. Uh, so that comes out in the memberships of things. And so uh, they do get, they have female members of the American Philosophical Society uh, by the 1770s. So it's, it's, you know, they weren't the first place to do it. The, the Franklin Institute, I know you said that they sold their collections. Mm -hmm. Is it, do they still have a library? They or have a library and they have a lot of Is material there, but. Um, accessible to the public? I never knew that. It's it's you, it's better if you call and make an appointment because well, they, yeah, they have a lot of stuff in remote storage. And so if you're looking for certain things, if it's in remote storage, they can get it there for you and you don't have to sit around for half a day. Um, as to what they have and don't have, I, I can't speak to that really because um, it's it was in the 90s that they, it was really sad. All the institutions in Philadelphia said, give us six months, we'll raise the money, keep all this in Philadelphia, but yeah. their then president wanted quick money. Well, yeah. This is why you got to watch boards, I'm sorry. And that, <laughs> that, that, another, another footnote to your thing. Um, 
the women's medical college records are in fact protected because yes, that Drexel. got merged into the Drexel yeah. School of Medicine. Both both the women the original Women's Medical College or Pennsylvania Medical College right. and Hahnemann go merged there. into and are administered by Drexel mm -hmm. and the records of the Women's Medical College are there. have been protected and preserved. And it's not just the records, the portraits of many of the first women doctors that used to be there, yes, they have a collection. collection of early equipment. All of that material is at Drexel now and being yeah. cared for. So that's that's been and that's remained in fact. But that's where I saw this scholarship of wives of the Iron Masters. Hmm. And I you know they how many of them got together and who was talking to who? Yeah. And what big accident caused them all to feel there needed to be better training. And if anybody else wants a one other thing that I, I that the Chester County Historical Society has an exhibit right now related to the Civil War. I'm not sure not how much longer it's going to be on there. But what I absolutely loved was one of their features was a feature on the Ladies Aid Society of Coatesville. And it is Rebecca's daughters and their daughters and her sisters and their daughters uh, but the entire portrait collection is all directly related to Rebecca. There's that it's really, it's really cool. I have a question back here. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I would like to know, you mentioned that Rebecca Lincoln was in um, communication of correspondence with various um, known abolitionists. Yes. Across your study, what letter to whom and what was the subject matter that made you sort of put that in your piece and sort of stood out to you as you read? Well, she is very, very close, good friends with Esther Lewis and Grace Anna, her daughter, and they were the biggest Underground Railroad stop in this county. They were the medical stop. William still mentions them very frequently. Um, there is no, nothing that you can say that Rebecca sheltered anyone or that she personally right. helped anyone, but you had to have a lot of money to keep this thing going. And there's a story they tell um, about John Vickers in Westchester, and John Vickers was in Westchester, he, he was on no stop uh, in Lionville. Lionville. And uh, someone said, I do not, if a weighty friend, that's our idea of you know E.F. Hutton type Quakers, you know, you stop and you listen to them. Uh, a weighty friend came up to him and said, I do not approve of what thee is doing, John, but here is $100 to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I suspect she probably did help in that way because she did a lot of other philanthropy. Um, and the, the, the Lewises themselves did not have that much money. And, um, uh, you know, you needed care for the medical care. Um, William still says they're clothing 100 fugitives minimum a week throughout the 1850s, if not before. Um, she is in correspondence with the Fussells. She is in correspondence with the Gibbons, who are also family connections, and they were big in the Underground Railroad. She writes letters that are supposed to be seed exchange letters with the Painter Brothers of Taylor's Arboretum, sorry, Tyler's Arboretum in central Delaware County, and they were known conductors, and she writes and Grace Anna did this too. That, you know, it's before the CIA, before people were really sophisticated. So this was code for the 1800s. Um, I am looking out my window, and I have several long icicles. Um, two, they are all black ice, and two are very long and mature, but three are very short. And I am wondering if they will grow. What can you tell me? How are you have icicles on growing on your side? And it's what it is is code saying this is who I'm sheltering. You know who's coming along down the down the way. So we know that was a code. Um, another time they talk about flowers that are coming up in the lawn, unexpected. And and at one time she writes a letter to Grace Anna which says. I had five packages of black wool arrive unexpectedly. Mm. Now she's in the ironworks. What is she doing with black wool? Mm. I don't know. Draw your own. It's an illegal activity, and I shouldn't tell you this, but I think it's beyond the time of, of 
statute of limitations. There was something called the Overground Railroad in the end of the of 1970s, early 1980s, when uh, you know we had the Contra Sandinista problem in El Salvador, and there were people that were being sent back at the border of immigration because it was thought that everybody that came from Central America was an economic fugitive. And they would send them back. And then the, our US government said, well, there's no problem because we haven't heard anything. Well, they were all on death lists and they were killed. Um, so starting with the Catholic Church, but then the Quakers got in on it and then all the churches got in on it. There was a whole underground railroad system to Canada. And I drove from, from, from Texas to Canada very frequently. I never knew the name of the people. I had descriptions of their age and what clothing they would be wearing. And so and this was so that if I got caught, I could never turn anybody else in. Um, and no, my meeting did it. My, we decided as a meeting. Uh, it's nothing to say about me. It's just like they asked me now for Friends Library, I write it up because nobody is going to remember. And the Underground Railroad's the same way. It was illegal. You're not going to put stuff down. So you get these strange letters and you think, why is she going? Why is she had these Victorian vapid things about icicles? And then you go, wait a minute. <laughs> so I, in answer to your question, that's the best that we can come up with. But given where her circle of friends were, I'd be surprised if she weren't involved in some way. Yeah. I, and my, my guess, just based on the research, is that predominantly she was funding things. One of the ways they may have been involved, we know Hopewell Furnace was, was with the I, gentleman I was talking to before. Um, to run the ironworks, you have to have charcoal. Do the charcoal burns? It's a messy, smelly job. You turn, <laughs> you turn black. Tell us about doing it. it. We <laughs> and so, in, in the there. books at Hopewell Furnace, it says these people must be very difficult to work with because people come and work with them for only three or four weeks and move on. Well, what they were were um, um, it, it, um, people who were self-liberated who stopped to earn a little pocket money. They were out in the woods. They could be covered in the Griscoms. Oh, that was another one that Rebecca Grucan's very good friends with Rebecca Griscom, whose father and brothers develop and run the school book now. And what's on the school book now? We know, we know Rebecca ran an underground railroad station. First of all, at Maiden Creek and then in Reading. Um, they're bringing anthracite coal. And I don't care what your skin pigmentation is. When you've handled that stuff, you're black. Um, and, and cement, the, the limestone for cement coming down, which turns you white. And what better to get away on the canal boats where the dogs can't track you through the water? So, and, and as soon as the 13th Amendment passes, the Griscoms get out of the school canal business. Duh, guess what they were doing? Um, so there's a lot of that kind of circumstantial stuff, which we can't prove one way or another, but you know, those that lie down with dogs get up with fleas. So, perhaps. <laughs> so you're, you're using that analogy in a little more positive way. <laughs> Um, another thing that she mentioned that if you haven't looked at it yet, you might consider Francis uh, Delmar, who is the um, education ranger up at Hopewell Furnace, has recently come out with a little book on the research that she's done on the involvement at Hopewell Furnace with um, the blacks. And her, her research is trying to attempting to document the um, fugitives going through the area and quite honestly the book that Walker's book that was you know considered the Bible of the Hopewell Furnace history was written in the 30s by a white man yeah. who pretty much ignored contributions by blacks and women and children, children. As, as did everybody else children played key but on the other in their over Spain. Blacks and but whites were treated the same. The way. black employees at Hope Welfare were treated the same, yes, the same way, else. were paid the same, same houses, houses, the same but, and, and they were treated the same way here too. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, one of the things I'd like to see someone do, I've looked at it a little bit, but not enough to draw any conclusions, is in Coventry and in this area, places where there are iron furnaces, there's suddenly an increase. That's not big, but there's an increase in people of color as residents by the 1850 census. And they all say they're born in Pennsylvania. Those that I can trace were not born in Pennsylvania. They were born in places like Eastern Shore, Maryland. I can trace four families from a certain part in North Carolina. Um, 
they came up here, they were absorbed, they found an employer who was sympathetic. I would like to know if, if there are African-American genealogists, they could contribute a great deal to our understanding of what makes Coatesville work. But I suspect that the iron business had a lot to do with providing work and, and a more friendly area. And then, of course, you get the 18th, the moment, we're getting way off the way, 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, where it's no longer right. you get to free soil, you're okay. Um, that's when they can come across the border and arrest you and drag you back into a slave state, and you have to go all the way to Canada. But up to 1850, once you got across the Mason-Dixon line, and you, had, you were in a community that wasn't going to turn you in, you were okay. And the first test of that is at Christiana. When they come up to capture the guys at Christiana, the Johnsons and others say, we're not going back without a fight. The Marylanders fire first. Um, and you have you know, what many people call the opening battle of the Civil War. Mm. September 11th, everything happens September 11th. <laughs> and and it's, it's the free blacks saying, no, we're not going back to slavery. And, and there had been a lot of that kind of infiltration. And that's when major families uh, that were on the Underground Railroad, like, um, oh, Abraham, I want to say Shed, and that's not right. Shad. Shad, thank you. Uh, and his family had moved from Wilmington to Westchester to get out of the slave state. But they're no longer safe in Westchester. And they go all the way up to Ontario. And his daughter becomes one of the first persons of color of national importance in, in, uh, in Canada. But it's that, that stage. So, you know, that's the, we don't know enough about that. And the records aren't there. They're going to have to put them together by looking at church membership and a lot of other stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we really want to thank you for coming tonight, and uh, you know maybe we'll have you back for another uh, speaking engagement because it is all very interesting, and uh, you know we, we really want to appreciate uh, your efforts tonight. If it's uh, if it's legitimate, show your work. If it's illegal, don't. <laughs> you don't want anybody to know about the process. But it's for the good of humankind, yeah. so continue so you to can do still it do just it. quietly. Yeah, right, right. So uh, and it, and it'd be fascinating. I know you mentioned Mariah Mitchell in Nantucket and. Uh, and, and the women uh, who ran the businesses up there, where the men were on the ships and, 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 yeah. uh, and, and the diversity there, very interesting. And then the women were at home setting up all the uh, negotiations and relations between sailmakers, rope makers, and har you know, harpoon makers, and, and warehouses and banks. It's very fascinating. Yeah. It's just like Deborah Franklin, who, you know, Benjamin's off running around. Guess who kept the, kept the Gazette going? Yeah. Guess who's doing the hiring, firing, all the bookkeeping? Mm -hmm. It's Deborah. She yeah. was no shrinking violet the way she's portrayed in history. Well, you can come visit our library, yes, thank you. and you can come visit our garden. So, and we want to get a furnace to talk about the scientific process. But thank you all very, very much uh, for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.